India is a very heterogeneous country, right? Everyone has very different demands, very different needs, languages. Hence, you will, in spite, even if let's say Amazon, Flipkart want to serve everyone, just because the needs are very different, you will not be able to make out for those, you know, long tail case use cases. And those long tail use cases are good enough to build sizable businesses. Hello and welcome to the Startup Popular Podcast. I'm Roshan Karyapa. We've seen how e-commerce has accelerated post-COVID and with that, e-commerce enablement businesses like GoQuick have become really important for merchants. In this conversation, I speak to Chirag Taneja, who's the founder and CEO of GoQuick, about some of the trends that he's seeing in the category, how they're helping merchants improve conversions, and some of the high-level challenges he's solving for the business, like prioritizing the product roadmap or hiring the right people for the job. This is an amazing conversation, a lot of insights in here that you might find useful. So let's get started on this podcast with Chirag Taneja. Hey Chirag, welcome to the Startup Popular Podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. Thanks Roshan for having me. Very, very excited to do this. Yeah. So Chirag, you have a ringside view to how e-commerce is evolving, you know, from D2C to social commerce to plenty of things. You know, to begin things, how do you see this uh, changing e-commerce uh, scene, especially in India? You know, I mean, post-COVID, there are plenty of things that have happened. So could you, you know, talk about a couple of things uh, from your perspective, what you're seeing? Sure. Uh, and, you know, I'll uh, now, of course, we have a ringside view, but I'll give you a perspective to it. Uh from the time I've been in e-commerce space and uh, I, I'm in this space for almost five years now. And uh, I have seen the, in fact, uh, another number to give you, I think 2014, we were at close to India e-commerce was close to $5 billion. Now it is close to $55, $60 billion, right? So in seven years, we've become what, 12, 13x. And if you look at it from that perspective, going from 50, 60 to 350 is like a 6, 7x only, right? And in which we have done all the foundational work, as it is said, first million is always tough. So we've done the hard work. And I think, of course, uh, helped by COVID a lot. One of the few things, one of the, I would say, only thing which was positive out of COVID. And I would say that, you know, of course, uh, in 2019, when COVID hit us for the first time, I was running Bombay Shaving Company and we were seeing our numbers on our website become double every month, quadrupling every quarter. And same was happening for some of our partner competing brands as well. And that happened across, you know, e-commerce, not only outside of uh, or not only Amazon Flipkart horizontals. But across D2C boomed, et cetera, et cetera. And what we have seen is whenever waves open up or lockdowns are lifted, then you typically see offline opening up and there is a small amount of dip which happens. Uh, but that dip, in my view, or at least what data indicates, it doesn't last more than 10 days. And I think what's happening is that replenishing inventories in offline stores also takes time and what i keep hearing now these days is that one online is of course convenient sticky behavior all of that and when people have gone to stores also they've realized that the inventory there is a little old it's dated hence people are again moving back to the online behavior so one of course that's sticky more convenient etc etc and when people are moving out also you're seeing that they like this experience better than the other one the inventory the assortment is better here and uh, You know, I think online has been able to find one element which has been better than offline at all moments. And I see that continuing. And in terms of numbers, we're seeing, you know, in spite of March, April, not being peak seasons in our country, we continue to see, you know, e-commerce grow across brands 25 to 30% from a March to April number. So continue to see growth. And uh, the expectation is... At least I have been vocal about it that I have a very strong data-backed belief on this that we're going to have 25 Mama's boats in five years and very, very legitly possible now. 
right no that's pretty awesome actually you know in the early days of flipkart and mintra and the likes i mean people would often talk about this 10 million user ceiling that we would hit right i mean the only uh, those are the only users that uh, you know e-commerce will cater to and so on but we've gone way beyond that right now and also what's interesting is we're seeing this whole non amazon non flipkart wave that is happening right now right i mean outside of uh, uh, these mainstream platforms i mean uh, of course shopify pioneered that uh, in the us i mean here we're seeing a bunch of folks right the likes of uh, misho trell and uh, and the others what do you make of that our uh, go quick as a thesis is backed on that india is going to have a lot of shopping which is happen- going to happen outside of amazon flipkart and uh, you know if i go back to 2019 there was a clear camp that d2c is not for india outside of amazon flipkart is not for india i think in the last one one and a half two years that narrative or at least i know that the camp has shifted completely to now people becoming super gango that uh, this is the space to be in i think both answers are wrong yeah, one was absolute no this one is absolute you know that there is no other place to be than d2c i think the answer is somewhere in the middle but it's a it's a reflection of uh, at least the euphoria is a reflection of a capital markets so to say or bull bull run globally but otherwise you know what i have seen is that india is a very heterogeneous country right everyone has very different demands very different needs languages hence you will in spite even if let's say amazon flipkart want to serve everyone just because the needs are very different you will not be able to make out for those you know long tail case use cases and those long tail use cases are good enough to build sizable businesses as e-commerce expands you can ex- you can imagine that these small problems if they have tailwinds then at scale they become large businesses opportunities so that's how i look at it as we were discussing like in the opening that from 50 to 350 if it's a 7x growth you just need to be in the right place and compound month on month right that's all you need in businesses the sit there tight and ensure that you solve for the merchant and continue to grow month on month right so on that note you know what do you make of ondc i mean it seems revolutionary right what are your thoughts agree i think revolutionary in terms of the overall thesis concept what they're building out i would still at least what i'm hearing uh, and i haven't gone deeper very deep into it but what i'm hearing is that still early stages of being rolled out hence you know there are at least camps in there where people at least uh, the grown ups feel that this is not going to work in india etc etc whereas a lot of uh, phone pays logistic companies are participating in the phase 1 roll out i think it has its own nuances in terms of what all can they power can it truly be a upi based open network you know digital commerce can supply be listed that way because supply then has to be rated it will come down to whether those are reliable suppliers or not we've all seen what kind of you know impact a cloud tail can do which is a trusted reliable uh, one it has multiple nuances to it and uh, i wouldn't say that i am an expert in this i'm trying to uh, go through this thesis deeply now but i'm i i personally want something like this to work out we have all seen impact of upi in our country and uh, this can have a similar kind of impact which can be scaled globally absolutely so as with any growing market right there are second order solutions and e-commerce enablement itself has become a huge category right now and there is plug and play infrastructure for an entrepreneur to literally start up a, a business over a weekend right i mean you have you know everyone from delivery to commerce iq to go quick your startup as well helping entrepreneurs what is this category like you know what are the what are the contours of uh, this e-commerce enablement category so roshan think of it like that there is a space which is happening Uh, which is growing at a massive pace and during covid uh, people were pushed to uh, there was no other option you had to do e-commerce and i i i come from those days when you know budgets were allocated in consumer product companies that if you had a 100 rupee budget 80 rupees got allocated to offline and whatever was left was given to digital the covid changed the narrative completely wherein now budgets are fixed for digital and then at least it's got the seat on the table so from those days you know uh, this space is expanding rapidly and there are people who are starting up their businesses to people who have got some sense of tmf are now scaling up to you know people who are well skilled up are now looking at increasing margins 
right so everyone everyone has a different need uh, in terms of how do they solve for e-commerce and in e-commerce i would say largely you would look at tech specific works for which you require a developer can there be a e-commerce company which can solve for that in a plug and play manner right uh, that's how i would look at it and i think a lot of companies can be born if you look at it from that lens and if there is a developer can i automate that work in so that a developer is not required uh, hence a company can be born there because we all know that as we move ahead in this technology journey developers will get scarce will get expensive and uh, companies which are which don't have a technology dna will find it difficult to attract that talent even if you have capital like we are seeing that happen uh, in india in so many other companies so that's how at least i define the space and then you know e-commerce has this four broad buckets discovery selection conversion retention so you will have problem areas in all of them and there are many companies which are trying to give power to all the e-commerce players in terms of solving different problems in these buckets right uh, wherein you have shipping aggregators solving for fulfillment needs and there are many such players in us shipo aggregators as well as gateways uh, similarly you know you have ch- uh, checkout companies you have uh, as you mentioned commerce iq which give intelligence which give tracking details and then if you start to move ahead then there are funnel related problems that who people who help you visualize the funnel in a better way over time you know there's this emerging space of co-op marketing which is that uh, brands get together and then advertise on each other's space so uh, very very uh, different areas which are emerging but largely in these buckets try to solve for the problem can start from being a cac problem to a cost problem so right. all over all over india well, it's an interesting way of looking at it right i mean uh, thinking of displacing the opportunity cost of having a developer to solve you know one of these uh, uh, problems in the four buckets you've had an interesting journey you know you were a chief uh, revenue officer at bombay shipping company working very closely with the founder what were those learnings there that led you to go quick because you know you had a job that you loved and you were clearly very successful and of course we all have multiple ideas we, we get ideas every week and every month uh, but what was that unique insight that pushed you off of your normal life to say that no i have to do this now so i have been in startups now for almost a decade now so started in 2013 and uh, it's the life which i like and uh, you know what what happened was if if we would have met in feb 2019 or feb 2020 i would have told you that you know i'm not going to do any more startup bombay shipping company is my place and uh, i'm doing very well just that i think covid happened and what became clear was which i was explaining you earlier that india e-commerce will significantly Hello? happen outside of amazon flipkart as well right so that was one trigger point for me and to i was a merchant myself i used to face certain kind of problem statements and i thought that okay if this space is going to expand then it these problems which are today minor will become major when it comes to solving these problems right and typically in businesses you would want headwinds in your business or oh, sorry tailwinds in your business and uh, you want them to grow fast and some meaningful problems so i have always had a lens of that is this a vitamin problem is is a pain killer problem so those kind of lenses that can i survive without it or will i immediately as a merchant resort to uh, taking the solution those are learnings from my past experiences that uh, you know what kind of problem and then of course we have always looked at gtm as one of the uh, important things i have been taught by my fellow founders that in technology businesses gtm is super 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 important it has to be uh, as smooth as you put knife in a butter uh, that that's that's the level of smoothness uh, gtm has to have and you know, that's how it started and of course i knew the merchant pain points i came from that side and another thing was you know after doing a cpg business consumer business uh, typically the path is that you uh, one would say that i should have gone on to do a consumer business right i understood a lot of brand a lot of 
content products how to market them online etc etc but i think what became clear to me was that while i had done that business i understand that business uh, i always was fascinated by technology and how technology can solve problems at scale and if i hear the finance business finance hat then this is a very high leverage business right you can create massive impact uh, if you get the product right uh, if you get the team right later on so i thought okay this is my at least opportunity at building out a tech business which can be very very fascinating so that was that was the at least thought point at, at the starting right and what was that process of initial customer validation talking to people understanding if this is really a, a critical problem for them and you know how how much or what they will pay and so on right i mean what was that process like so we we still follow that and i think the way at least we go about it is that we typically you know and i've seen people getting confused in this we in gokwek also we separate problem discovery from problem solution so for example if somebody sends me an invite and saying we are going to do discuss about this problem then either it has to be a discovery meeting or a solution meeting you can't have one meeting in in which we discuss both mm-hmm. so i think that's the ground rule if you want to solve a real good problem because what happens is if you're not solving if you've not discovered the right problem right then you will end up giving a wrong solution so right. the more emphasis has to be given on have we discovered the right problem yeah. i think all problems are solvable to an extent just that have we articulated it the right way have we understood it the right way if it is articulated then you will find that there are many brilliant people in the country who can solve it in fact in our team also we've seen that that if we articulate it rightly and ask them have you got it it becomes a different ball game and i think that's how it started now of course as the team has expanded so now i have tried, started to write this that problem discovery separate from problem solution uh, we started with that way that i knew certain problem pain points for merchants and i thought that okay if this is the problem statement there was no validation which was required for the pain point now it had to be articulated that what exactly is the problem statement is it a symptom or is it the core if you are in the business of solving symptoms then you will continue to solve symptoms the core won't get solved right okay. for example we always do that when a laptop goes off we will typically restart and uh, yeah. thinking that okay this is going to get solved but that's more like solving symptoms do you get to the root cause so at gokwek also there is a culture of getting to the root cause identifying why this happened why how it could have been prevented even for let's say small bugs errors but going back so that's how it started wherein i had certain problem statements validated with the market went down understood what is the consumer pain point then prepared seven eight solutions for it went to the market few merchants tested with them spoke with multiple vcs on how does this sound to you from a problem validation aspect and then you know when there was a lot of resounding yes from a lot of people that okay this this looks fascinating this is going to work looks like a great gtm etc etc and uh, you know that's how it started right okay so i think that's more than enough background for us to get into actually what gokwek does if i understand correctly you solve problems across the funnel you know from conversion optimization to something like return to origin right which is a key problem for uh, e-commerce merchants as such so could you describe gokwek in your own words and also talk about a few popular use cases yeah so gokwek as i said is a company which is trying to democratize shopping experience in other words we're saying can we provide amazon type experience to the non amazon world right that's our vision and uh, as i said that there are four buckets what we've done is we've started with conversion as the first bucket wherein even if you start to break down conversion also or uh, we like to put it as that we are in the business of improving gmv by solving shopping experience now if you start to break down gmv it is transaction into aov and we further break down transaction then it is conversion rate into number of visitors on the website right. today we solve everything from a conversion rate aspect wherein if you have someone on the website then can we help you convert better and we look at return to origin as a conversion rate problem why because when we went deeper into the nature of the problem we realized that this is a large consumer intent problem vis-a-vis to originally thought of as a supply chain problem i like to give give this a example or analogy that in a credit risk space right uh, once you have given a loan 
then it becomes a collection problem it's no more a credit risk problem so in our business also which order has to be given cod and which order doesn't need to be given cod is the decision to be taken once that is taken then it becomes a delivery problem and if you go deeper into it you will realize that you know it's largely a consumer intent problem more than a logistic problem it was originally thought to be largely a logistic problem uh, the kpi rs with the supply chain guy etc etc i think the way to i was giving you this analogy that uh, the way to look at credit risk is that once you've given a loan then after giving the loan it becomes a collection problem it's no more a credit risk problem same with our case that you need to analyze whether we need to offer cod to this person or this transaction or not once it is given then it becomes a logistic problem right so hence we are in the business of predicting consumer intent via a lot of data science heavy lifting that's what we do and we do a bunch of other products in form of uh, checkout optimizations which is taking over the transaction post at to cart till end of transaction and help merchants realize higher gmv by way of higher prepaids by way of higher conversions we have seen up to 50% higher conversion rates more than 20% increment in prepaids through our products and similarly on payment side you know we look at products from a very e-commerce lens pgs look at from a payment gateway lens we look at from a e-commerce lens and i think that's that's what we get that what what should a merchant look at what is a merchant supposed to look at and can we solve their pain point so we've been keeping a close ear to what merchant is saying and uh, just been building those products and uh, that's what i what has got us here right and if you talk to merchants uh, often enough you'll hear a plethora of problems right so i wonder you know how you prioritize some of this and how does it feed into your product roadmap and so on i mean you spoke about discovery solution and and looking at it from the lens of conversion optimization but how do you think of your product roadmap as such oh well, that's a great question i think uh, any business if you start start speaking to customer and if customer starts to believe that you can actually solve their problem then they'll come to you with a with loads of requests right that this should be done etc etc and i think we have some clear lens of what is our business so we we keep that at the center and uh, we always have a merchant backward approach so we would definitely want to put customer anecdote over data and then start to look at things that okay is this feature which is requested is it applicable to large majority of merchants or is it a single large merchant request and you know we have seen very very different things so for example a new feature request from a small merchant also most likely is a request which will be used by everyone so uh, it it is believed otherwise that uh, a large merchant request will be needed by everyone but we have seen at least our data indicates that a small merchant request is typically would be used by everyone so but it's interesting right maybe maybe a large merchant request i mean people are not mature enough to experience that pain basically right yes and you know what happens in saas companies is that you end up prioritizing for the large merchant you know so those requests are typically taken up and uh, you tend to make them uh, there's nothing wrong in it but i think uh, we are in the business of democratizing shopping experience we believe that we need to power everyone from small to large to extra large so that's how we look at it but you are so right that in terms of prioritization it is always a challenge from a roadmap perspective but i think what we do is we lay out a uh, what amazon has taught us that we lay out a one and a half year pr article saying that this is what the news should be in december 2022 and then work backwards from there that okay this is the vision now can we work backwards and say this is you know this is all what we will do in the product road map and in this and in that one first three months are very very frozen in terms of what all is going to be there and of course we keep buffer in terms of uh, you know till date we keep a buffer of 40% 45% of our bandwidth is ad hoc plus new feature request so co- very cognizant of the fact that we will miss certain things which merchants will request and we'll end up making and uh, then you know we keep evolving so it's a rolling 3 month plan not a quarterly basis it's a rolling 3 month plan which will keep continue to evolve and keep tracking that whatever was our north star uh, number or vision 
was that right was that wrong can we modify were we audacious enough so we we keep questioning all of that to keep uh, you know stretching ourselves that are we really thinking big right and if you look at the distribution side of things because as you mentioned it's pretty important a uh, very important in fact right so how does customer acquisition work for you you know because as i said e-commerce enablement itself is uh, becoming a pretty big category and there are literally hundreds or maybe thousands of plugins and so on that uh, people can use but at the same time merchants may not be savvy enough to discover some of these tools or solutions for themselves and they may need some help and guidance and what not right so so are you looking at it a little more con- consultatively because when i look at the go quick website i mean it seems like a one stop shop for all merchant uh, problems on conversion right so how does acquisition work for you we have been i would say there is a good product market fit for our kind of product ours is kind of a performance product it works and there is a inbuilt product led growth wherein it's a network business now we have close to 80 million users so who are powered on the network in different ways hence it becomes no brainer for a lot of e-commerce players to look at our business look at joining us and uh, with that lens i think we do see a lot of inbound requests coming our way our business is mostly inbound in nature we do have a smallish four or five people uh, sales team which is mostly dealing with some amount of strategic clients some clients which you want to uh, uh, reach out to enterprise won't do a lot of or at least large excel line enterprise won't do a lot of inbound stuff Th- those are the merchants which they go after but uh, i think in our business cac has never been a concern you know uh, there is practically if your product works then people are happy to pull it put it on if it doesn't work then you know it's a difficult sell so that's the way to look at it and uh, and i think it's been true for uh, a lot of product led saas companies that if you if you believe in plg then you tend to power it that way uh, and then and in india at least i would say the ecosystem is not very very large that the word spreads quickly uh, there are whatsapp groups everywhere around which are there of founders Uh, or of digital growth marketers etc and the word gets out very quickly which works both ways right positive as well as negative and uh, so that's how at least it's been working for us but it it was initial first 10 12 15 months now we'll ramp up on our marketing efforts sales efforts right and what are some high level challenges that you're solving right now uh, as a founder you know to power the next level of growth uh, for go quick So you know it's a it's a little tricky that when you start a business the first challenge is that you need to find out some early sense of some product market fit that is there a early pmf which is visible that's what you are searching for the next one is is there a scalable product market fit and then of course there is profitable product market fit i think we are in the phase where it is about scalable product market fit and once you start to get into product market fit zone typically what happens is that your team sizes expand uh, whatever was okay to ignore in the early stage now suddenly starts to become a, or is starts to be visible as a crack so you need people to fill those gaps what it means is that as a company from a headcount perspective you start to grow that becomes a challenge that how do you now build out the org design how do you ensure that there is culture how do you ensure that there is alignment of purpose of what we are trying to achieve and you know there is a deeper nuance there that interpretation of a sentence in remote world can be very very different for 10 different people and you will realize this when there is a end of sprint end of month that they were busy in doing something but it wasn't leading to the objective how do you so my job has become in addition to the new product discoveries uh, is one getting the right team in place so getting right product folks right senior people in the team and i think i would say touch, touch would have done well there uh, wherein we have some some senior folks from product industry who joined us from amazon swiggy flipkart razer pay payu so they've joined us similar in uh, customer success we have folks from mo engage so these large global uh, sprinkler some of these large global cs companies and similar in technology we have folks from amazon flipkart who have started to join us so uh, that way i think we've done well 
I think now it's about how do we keep them aligned to single objectives, what the company is trying to chase, keep repeating them, you know, reinforcing them uh, and making way for also them, right? You When you hire senior people, you need to make way also for them that how do they become successful, right? They don't need to, they know, they know their job, right? They don't need to be coached on the skill. I think just that the environment is, context is new for them. So how do you give them the right context? How do you ensure that there are small wins, early wins available for them before they start to, you know, roll on their own? So that that's become some part of our job in addition to what we've been doing, right? From managing investors to managing clients to ensuring that our products are performing. At some level, the founder's job is very simple in, in the sense that you hire the best people and then you enable them, right? If only it was that simple. So it's easier said than done. But you're right that uh, at every stage, I would say a different skill set is required. At least I have a view on this that if we would have got some great one to 10 folks in zero to one phase, we would have probably... Uh, boxed ourselves in a very very different way but what it meant was that we had certain kind of people in zero to one now they need to be transitioned to the one to ten phase so they need to be coached mentored trained on what is the new expectation help them develop the skill be patient there so those are some of the things which we are doing investing in their success as a company you're right that hiring hiring is an important task and that's probably what I do, I end up spending 60% of my time on hiring and managing some of those people. Yeah, I, I think uh, you bang on there. So just a follow up on that note, right? I mean, you mentioned zero to one and one to 10. I think you need very different mindsets operationally to function in both these phases. What are some of those characteristics that you see of people, you know, who can function in both, right? I mean, who have done the zero to one and are now like, you know, really kicking ass in the one to 10 journey. It's a tough one mentally. First, you have to accept that this is a change of arena, right? It's a tough one because you're working with the same set of people. And now, you know, uh, we, we used to celebrate uh, a lot of firefighting when we started out the business. That's how it works. And now we changed gears to saying that now no more celebration of firefighting. Uh, we started with safe to fail to now a scaled up product can't be, you know, you can't push out something which suddenly stops to work. So it forces you to reflect a lot of on your initial values to now a scaled up company has different values, right? Or those interpretations become a little difficult that you can fail, but you can't fail on prod. You can, you can fail on dev modes, you can fail on documents, uh, but you have to got it right on production. Right. So uh, I think and in zero to one phase, I would say there is a lot of data in absence of data. There is a lot of gut uh, which a founder has that, OK, this is what I believe is going to work. And you have a very smallish team. So good part is that you have a smallish team who can rally around you and you get momentum because it's a lean team. One single thing you hit and you are on. Now in this phase, the moment uh, at least mass expands because the number of people expand and now it's about that okay can you get into that rhythm of managing people people are your leverage good part is that you get a lot of data now so now it's no more about that gut it it is it has to be data driven decision making if you start to make gut calls now then i think you're doing disservice uh, because now there is so much data which is coming your way and you need to take informed decisions basis those data right so that's how it starts to change. Uh, you know, from a founder perspective, you were used to taking some gut calls. Now you have to change gears and you have to take data driven calls. Uh, you were used to throwing people at the problem. Now you're saying, let me get some specialists and ask them to do their jobs. You were used to living in a very, very ambiguous world wherein, you know, I uh, having very, very high self belief that, okay, we're going to win from here to now having a very different set of people who know that, okay, this is my domain. We're going to clearly draw our swim lanes and uh, this is where we will run. So that's how it changes. Right. Uh, it's a great summary. You know, one thing that we ask entrepreneurs on the podcast is what are those unique insights from operating in the space that you operate 
that could be useful to someone who is uh, not used to this right i mean someone from who's looking on the from the outside on e-commerce enablement and saying that hey i should probably you know build a business in this it seems like you know building shovels in a gold rush right i mean so let me think of some technology solution for all of these growing e-commerce merchants or whatever what are some two or three things they should keep in mind uh, what are those things they may not know just from looking at it from the outside I would say, I think we have been lucky that, uh, you know, e-commerce has really grown very, very fast in the last one and a half, two years, but uh, that we wouldn't have predicted, you know, that this is going to happen this way. So I would say, let's, let's continue to be long-term bullish on the trend, right? That's number one for me that you are in a space which is going to grow. And then you start to look at. Uh, you know, which is very, very positive for me. For example, the market this year might not be as bullish as what it was last year. But that doesn't mean that e-commerce is not growing. We're still less than 10% of retail is e-commerce, right? So you have to look at it from a macro perspective that where is this headed, right? As the younger generation catches on, they they become mainstream. Uh, where is this headed? So if you're bullish on that, then there is meaning to going deeper in terms of what are the different problem statements. And you can look at it from different perspectives. Uh, what are the new emerging trends in e-commerce? Right? Where is e-commerce going to happen in our country? Is it going to be NFT, Web3, metaverses of the world? Or is it going to be, is it going to happen on WhatsApp? Is it going to happen on social? Is it going to happen on Insta? And that's where you will realize that a lot of opportunities, while the retail, uh, I like to put it this way, that history repeats itself, but in a new avatar. So you will see retail will continue to happen, but the format will change, something will change. Uh, hence, it will give everyone a new opportunity. So, so and shopping experience, uh, you know, which, which takes me back to a very interesting one that when we started the company, we had two names. One was GoQuick, second was Safecart, wherein we thought that, okay, shopping experience will be about safety, is my shopping experience safe, etc. And the other one is that shopping experience will always be about smoothness, convenience. And when we went deeper into it, we realized that this is going to be always be about convenience while safety will become hygiene. So you will continue to see more convenience problems being there. And similarly, as I was saying, where is consumer moving? Consumer is, let's say, moving to WhatsApp, Instagram, social of the world. So that's where opportunity is. You look at it from a technology point of view, where is technology moving? So is technology giving you more opportunities? Will there be a face ID which will detect you and say, okay, I smile and the shopping is done. So that's where the world is headed. And uh, then you, as an entrepreneur, you take a call that, okay, if this is a two year thing, which is going to happen, can I grab this as a starting point and build out a e-commerce enablement business or any kind of business, right? And I think one thing which is very, very clear to me is that it's a long-term play. It's not, any business is not going to work out in a couple of years. It's going to take seven, 10 years. So we better commit to it long term. This is a, you know, even it's a VC backed business, traditional business, bootstrapped business. Everything works on compounding. So that's the holy grail, which by nature, by design, it is, it is supposed to happen in long term. Fantastic. So Chirag, before you leave any books or podcasts that you would recommend to our listeners? I can recommend a lot of books depending on topics, but some of the some of the good ones, at least alt, which I reread every quarter is the first one is uh, high output management by Andy Grove. So that's at least on top of my list. Then for SaaS businesses, I think there is a good one called from impossible to inevitable. Very, very good. Uh, yeah. So good one. Then I think generally if you, if, if anyone is a fan of probabilistic thinking, then thinking in bets is a great one. Uh, that how do you think it doesn't come naturally to us then uh, I think factfulness is another one which I like but I'm a Nasim Taleb fan so Black Swan uh, I can go on from a podcast perspective um, I, I used to like Tim Ferriss show but I'm a regular listener of uh, Knowledge Project for Nun Street so that one I definitely listen to and then uh, there's another one called Masters of Scale by Reid Hoffman these are at least which are coming to my mind at the moment yeah right great recommendations uh again thank you so much uh, for being on the podcast chirag this was super insightful and i'm sure that will be very valuable to our listeners thank you thanks roshan have a great day thank you for listening to another episode of the startup operator podcast uh, 
we put out a couple of episodes every week and a roundup where we talk about the news and events from the Indian startup ecosystem. Do share all of this content with your fellow startup operators. Uh, it could be valuable and insightful for them. Also, before you leave, uh, follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn and Twitter and subscribe to our WhatsApp newsletter if you want all of this content delivered to your inbox. Thank you and have a great day.